All right, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves, uh, talk a little bit about themselves and their companies, and then we're going to kick off with some questions. So um, let's go ahead, and if you don't mind starting. Yeah, nice to see you all. I'm Adam Dilley. I lead uh, engineering at Quantum Metric, and uh, I won't spend much time on, on what we do, but I'll, I'll tell you about our, our mission and how it's connected to the topic that we have today. So we talk about how we want to build cultures at companies that are maniacally focused on winning the hearts of their customers. So we often hear about, I want to improve the experience, but um, there's not as many companies who have a culture that is just built around satisfying their customers, who are just maniacally, and we like to use that word because it just tells you the, the strength of that feeling that we want at companies where they say, I just want to create the best, most seamless experience, one that I would think about as a product that I love to use. Um, and so I'm really excited to talk about this topic today. Yeah, and hello everybody. Um, how's everybody doing? Um, I am Cecilia Liu. I lead product engineering at Sprig. At Sprig, we are building a um, AI native product insights platform that in a nutshell empowers product builders like you all to build better products based on deep understanding and empathy for your users. Um, a little fun fact about myself, um, I, well, I live in San Francisco with my husband. I have a two-year-old daughter who is a handful. Uh, fun fact about me, I taught second graders in New York City public schools before I became a software product manager. Um, and I learned to play the French horn as an adult, which was fun. Very cool. Hi, everybody. Um, Andrew Jensen, SVP of product at User Testing. And, um, so basically responsible for product management, product operations, and, and data science. And for those that are not as familiar with, data, uh, with user testing, uh, so we basically build a human insights platform um, that allows our customers, who are UXers, designers, uh, researchers, marketers, to engage with your customers, your users, um, and bring their insights in uh, so to help you make product decisions, UX decisions, and, and just build better UX and CX overall. Um, about myself, so I'm, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, also married, two daughters, and uh, yeah, big, big into cycling and, and endurance events. Awesome. Okay, well, we're going to dive right in. We have a lot of uh, great questions for our panelists today. All right, first off, uh, the cup is going to be Adam, and this is a little bit of a heavy one, so um, we'll... we'll Love to hear your answers for this. All right, how are you building a culture of user-driven curiosity across your product and UX teams to ensure that user insights are effectively integrated into decision making? Um, I'd also love to hear how you ensure seamless collaboration between different functions to not only deeply, to talk, sorry, to not only develop innovative products, but also align them with broader revenue and business objectives. So I'll start with you. Okay, so multi-part question, multi-part answer. I also realized I forgot the assignment already on a uh, fun fact. So I live in Colorado, cold state. Uh, I picked up coffee roasting years ago. So I source you know, raw beans from all over the world. I roast them. Great, great when it's cold in Colorado to have your own roasted coffee, endless supply. Okay, so um, decision making. I like to think about um, what's the story you wanna tell when we're approaching a product effort. And I think before you get into re building requirements, designs, certainly before you get into writing a line of code, think about what is the story I want to tell at the end of this effort? So who is the person with the problem? What role are they in? What does success look like in their role? And when you think about that from the very beginning, um, it can align decision making towards that story that you want to tell. And certainly measurables, uh, KPIs, that sort of thing, you can drive your insights towards the things that that story is aligned around. So. Um, I love the story to be the kind of thing that ties the effort together. Um, and then you mentioned curiosity. Uh, I heard John from Walmart this morning talk about uh, siloed analytics. You know, like you, you have to go ask an analytics team for some kind of uh, answer to the question about your product. And it just seems like if you want to drive curiosity within your team, uh, how can you make them go somewhere else for the answer to their question? So I think giving them the tools that they need to build that curiosity, you know, all of us have some aspect of, of session replay and what we do. I love being able to go sit down and watch a user use the product that I'm building. Um, that drives curiosity, not making me go ask a team, 
uh, to take two weeks and bring me back a report. So certainly giving them what they need. And then aligning the business was the last part you mentioned. Um, and we, uh, we've taken the traditional product trio, the idea of a PM, engineering leader, and designer, and we've added a fourth point to that, which is someone from our field teams. Now this doesn't necessarily apply to every single company, but we have field teams who are working with our existing customers and our prospects every single day. And this is something that PMs try to do um, by you know, having meetings with the customer, something certainly you should all do. We talk about it all the time. But there's something special about someone who spends every day working with customers. We've made that the fourth point of our product team. So they're, they're generous with their time to work within our teams and help us drive that, that specific customer viewpoint into the decisions that we make. And that's really what helps align the business to the goal you're trying to achieve for the customer. So sorry, I didn't know a lot there, oh, but I love that. long great. question. Love it. Um, Cecilia, do you want to add anything to that? I, I just want to echo what Adam said. I really love this concept of, you know, creating this culture of curiosity and really like fundamentally deeply believe in that you don't hold all the answers. You have a lot of power. You hold a lot of answers. You should know the inside and inside and out about your product. But in the day, you don't get to decide how your customers spend their dollars, right? They fundamentally hold that power. And and I think, you know, it's so key for us, you know, to think about business growth, um, to really lead with that curiosity and try to, like, you know, walk a mile in your customer's shoes. And I think that can unlock a lot of understanding that you otherwise would, you know, be missed opportunities. Yeah, just, just honing on the, on the culture part, um, just, you know, in addition, it was, I think, in line with what was mentioned, Sometimes we talk about uh, kind of moving from more of like an orchestra approach to like, you know, evolving to a jazz band. And so the orchestra approach you know, has a conductor and, and we were talking about product operations and the evolution of product operations. And if you know, your teams are not talking to their customers or it's not ingrained in your culture um, to put, you know, certain stage gates or, you know, processes in place to do that. And then once people start to see the wins and understanding like, oh, wow, I'm much more confident in my decisions. I have the data that it really gets beautiful when it starts evolving into this jazz band where people are kind of working on their own. They know, you know when to actually reach out, when to trust their own intuition, and uh, really just kind of evolving and, and being very productive. Awesome, okay. Um, so let's move on and we're gonna talk about the importance of measuring user satisfaction, super important. Um, what role does user satisfaction play in your process and business growth overall? And we're gonna start with Cecilia on this one. You know. I love this question, and the reason is that there are, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but to me, there are so many mantras and models and frameworks and truisms in product management that we so often just take at face value and we never take the time to step back, you know, ask, the, ask why, right? So I'm, I'm glad we're stepping back and asking why here, and so let's get to the core of it. To me, the core here, the answer to this question comes down to one word, and that is value. What I mean by that is the value you create through your product is fundamentally what makes that product successful, is what makes your business grow. But for anyone who's taken Econ 101, you'll know that the concept of value is so highly complex, right? It is multidimensional, and more importantly, it is subjective. Um, the, pro the product value is not solely determined by intrinsic factors that you can control. In fact, it is often determined by the value your users place on your product based on the perceived benefits that they derive from, from your product. And so, for example, your product is intrinsically valuable if it provides an effective solution to a problem. But then that value is also determined by a, a slew of other factors like how differentiated it is, how motivated your, your users uh, to solve that problem, how much their bosses are breathing down their necks to solve that problem, right? You know, um, what's their best alternative, their, their perception of your brand, and a, and a whole lot of other social and emotional factors. Um, and so if that, that, you know, sometimes like FOMO plays a big part in, in like the value that user place on your product. So I think it's that complexity and subjectivity when it comes to determining value um, is why user satisfaction makes such critical KPIs for product managers, for product builders out there, because like all of these factors, whether that's intrinsic utility of your product or 
extrinsic market dynamics or like, you know, the emotional connections your user have to your brand can all be measured and translated and reflected in user satisfaction measurements. So in that sense, I see user satisfaction metrics as um, like vital signs right, for, for your product and your business. It provides essential information for the overall health of your product and your business, and it can give you like early, early detection for any change or deterioration that might occur. And I would go so far as to argue, even when you have very clear marching orders about like very specific business outcomes to, to um, optimize for, whether that's conversion or top line revenue or gross margin, um, user satisfaction often make very reliable counter metrics to, to monitor, so don't lose sight of that. I think the fun thing about working in product is we have examples all around us. Like We are all users of products, and the value that you're talking about is something that if, if we all sit down and think about what products do I give my money to? Um, some of them are going to be out of necessity, but a lot of them we're going to think about why do I give my money uh, to that particular product? And it all is going to come down to value and an experience that's created along the way. And a lot of times it's just, I love the seamlessness of this particular experience. I love how it feels like it knows what I need. Um, and a lot of times it's going to come down to that value. It provides me something that saves me time or helps me get through a day. Or, um, so I love that, that idea of just pinning it all value. Okay. All right. So, Andrew, we're going to move on to you. Um, all right, tell us how you're integrating both product KPIs and user experience metrics into your product lifecycle at user testing, and how you measure the impact of these experiences on retention and adoption. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so, you know, when we think about our product metrics, um, typical SaaS metrics like retention, adoption, um, overall usage, we're generally using them in kind of the beginning of the product lifecycle when we're aligning our product strategy with our, our business objectives and then taking that a step down and what are we, how are we prioritizing and continuously prioritizing what's in our roadmap? Like what are the business objectives um, and the usage objectives that we're looking to accomplish? And then, um, but it's, as we know, products and those usage metrics are only gonna be as uh, successful if our, our users and our customers are actually finding value and so that's why the UX metrics are, are such an important factor to be considering along the way. So we think of our product lifecycle, the, the three areas that we think about metrics typically are in the beginning when we're talking about like the prioritization of what we're doing and then measuring when we release our solutions, to, you know, are they heading in the right direction? But where it, where it gets a little ambiguous where you can't measure with live data is as you're building, as you're designing. Um, and it's, it's just so important to make sure that you're keeping on the right track, that you're hitting your, your user needs. And that's where you, know, you can often get astray. Um, and and you know, we, we have so many examples where we've been saved uh, you know, by this process of, of just kind of reaching out and, and validating the UX metrics. There was actually one just this past week, a you know, great example that you know, I thought I'd kind of bring um, to this discussion is just that we we're building this new AI capability that our customers um, have been asking for for a long time, and we, we know that this is going to be a, you know, a great solution that, that we're really excited about building. And it, we're building a report and analytic that goes along with it. And if you asked everybody in the product team, in the organization, they would have looked at that analytic and said that, you know, this is exactly what everybody needs. It, it hits the mark. And fortunately, as we do, we go out and actually validate uh, success metrics with our, our customers and got the feedback that, yes, there's a deeper level a persona that really resonates with this level of depth, but uh, you know, fortunately, we found out that the majority of the users, you know, they didn't understand it. They basically, you know, it, it got to the point where some people actually said it makes them feel stupid, which is <laughs> which is not exactly what you want for you know building your products and and gaining adoption. So in getting that, there's metrics, and then and getting that uh, kind of qualitative feedback, we're able to uh, know what metrics are we can place first so that everybody understands they can quickly grasp and take away, it provides the value, and then know what the deeper level metrics are for you know, the people that actually want to have um, and spend the time to really understand and, and get deep into, in, into the, the overall quali quantitative data. So it's things like this that, um, you know, why it's really important and we really value the UX metrics in addition to you know, getting those UX metrics and then making sure it gives us a lot more confidence that we're going to be successfully driving our, our 
business KPIs and product KPIs overall. Yeah, um, I just want to add on to what Andrew said. I think you um, touched on a really important point, which is like oftentimes the observable user action that's like captured through user analytics um, data are lagging indicators, right? And sometimes really like first party in context feedback or like, you know, the user experience data points, um, those are really valuable leading indicators. And that's something like, you know, we, we practice what we preach at Sprig. You know, when we launch a product at Sprig, you know, we have all of the analytics dashboards set up and everybody's, you know, kind of like watching the data rolling in, but we also have of, you know, one question surveys out there and replay set up and, and, you know, those responses get published, you know, via Slack integration to the entire company. And oftentimes, you know, we can see like early warning signs um, through those like user feedback responses before that is captured through, you know, user action analytics. And all that comes from doing your work early. Um, so I, I, a big mistake people make is waiting till too late in the process to think about what are the metrics of success here, but just another plug for all the way back up at the story. Um, what is it that we're trying to move? What's the metric we're trying to shift with this particular effort? You'll know at the very beginning what you're going to monitor, and that's why you have them set up beforehand when it goes to launch. All right, well, we're going to stick with you, Adam. Um, in your experience, what role does customer-centric prioritization play in managing competing roadmap efforts? We don't have any of those, right? <laughs> None. How do you ensure that the most critical features which have the highest impact on customer value are prioritized for development accordingly? So, slight side note based on the end of that question, how, how do you make sure they're prioritized for development? I, uh, I lead product engineering, so I care just as much about you know, driving customer value as I do about team efficiency. And um, one of the things I always like to keep in mind is you know, there's, there's the big efforts. They're kind of like our top priority, um, which I'll talk about in a second. But then I also care a lot about efficiency. So filling in the cracks with things getting done and customer value constantly going out the door means that the development team is not always going to be working on the top priority thing but they're working on some smaller efforts, which also have customer value, which you can kind of make sure you're getting out to the market. But getting to that um, you know, customer-centric overall prioritization of what we're working on is hard because there's so many signals coming at us from different directions. It's like, uh, you know, what's the level of effort behind different things? What's the potential revenue? What's the customer reach? Uh, what's the CEO yelling loudest about? You know, like there's a lot of things that, that go into our heads and we have a long list of items and how do you pick from those things based on all those signals. And sometimes I like to just simplify it with the team and say, if you could just deliver one thing to our customers at the next launch and potentially nothing else gets done, what would that one thing be? And the team, you can just see them gravitate towards the ones that are more important and they're still taking all those signals into account. You know, I know this one's gonna take longer than that one and this one has more revenue but it really puts the whole thing through a customer lens. And it's like, if I can only give the customer one gift, it's gonna be this particular effort at that next launch. Either of you wanna weigh in on that? Okay. Um, okay, so Andrew, we'll go back to you. How do you bring the conversation of product and UX metrics to the exec team? Demonstrating how these metrics support broader business KPIs and success metrics. Yeah, so I, I guess just on the most fundamental basis that we have a monthly uh, kind of product uh, meeting with our, our leadership team um, so to really kind of drive that conversation and making sure that we have accountability within our product team, which are you know, product leaders and design leaders, to make sure that when they're thinking about the, the, and building the products that um, they're, they're you know, responsible for uh, making sure that we're driving successful um, you know, product KPIs and metrics, but also, you know, UX metrics as well. And so, um, you know, the UX metrics are great in, in the, with the, the leadership team as well because you're, you know, bringing forward what, what users are saying, what they're doing. Um, you know, we all have the, the challenge when there's a lot of opinionated people across the leadership team about, you know, we need to build these certain things, why, you know, having to, to drive a certain direction, but having user feedback of, of um, you know, really kind of reinforcing what's on the roadmap, why we're building things is, is super critical um, in getting alignment. And then so on the UX metric part, you know, we, we 
uh, have a bunch of metrics that we like to use. One of them is, is NPS, and um, I think like a lot of uh, you know, product teams out there, there's a little bit of a love-hate relationship with NPS because it, it's, it's really good at showing the trends of you know, how uh, sentiment is tracking over time, but it sometimes has very difficult to get actionable data. And a lot of companies and leadership teams love NPS, um, but in order to make it more actionable, what we found in our team is you know, taking the massive data sets of NPS feedback and user feedback, using LLMs, kind of you know, driving that in a chat GPT, and then you can have these really great conversational, um, prompt-based conversations to really dive deep into what are the, the, the root trends that are driving these broader kind of, uh, you know, NPS, uh, you know, trends overall. So that's been super helpful. Um, another one is a, a QX score. It's a, it's a metric that we use that um, not only has like attitudinal data of what people are saying, but uh, behavioral data. Like are people successful in actually engaging with this feature or this capability? And so we set up different benchmarks across our product and experiences where um, you know, we set up a score, and then as we release new capabilities, how it, making sure that the QX score is tracking in the right direction. And if it's not going in the right direction, just having the conversations of going in, finding struggle, uh, you know, finding where people, users are getting hung up, where there's not a lot of value, and optimizing. So, you know, by, by you know, pulling this up to our, our leadership team and not just looking at, you know, it's important to look at SaaS KPIs and, and uh, kind of usage KPIs and, and you know, obviously, alignment with our business objectives, but you know, bringing the customer voice into that um, you know, really just allows us to make sure that we're all on the same page of like why we're building things and, and what, what is the actual end user goal that we're trying to accomplish. Okay, well, speaking of, you mentioned LLMs. Um, the next question is gonna be around a little bit of AI, right? So how should product builders think about user satisfaction in the age of AI? Yeah. Um, it's a media question, so I think I'll answer in two parts. Part one is how should you think about user satisfaction if you're building AI product yourself, right? And before we talk about what's different, I actually want to like talk a little bit about what remains the same. And in my opinion, everything you know I was discussing earlier about value, about you know leveraging user satisfaction to really understand the value your product brings, all of that should remain the same. And I would argue that you know, it, mat it matters even more if you're building AI products because you know, it, it, it's so easy for us sometimes to get distracted by what I call shiny objects um, and lose sight of what's actually important. And in this case, AI is the shiny object. And, and what I mean by that is that you know, we run the risk sometimes, and I'm guilty of that too, um, of falling in love with our own product, with how you know, cool and cutting edge our ideas are, with how magical AI makes everything, right? And then you lose sight of whether the AI capability actually meets the needs of, of your users. And remember, the AI technology itself doesn't automatically make a product good. Um, it's the value that you create I'm a broken record at this point. It's the value you create through the application of AI that makes a good product. That being said, I, I do think there are unique things to think about when it comes to user satisfaction for AI products. And one of the those one of those things I think is worth uh, talking about here today is I think trust plays an outsized role when it comes to user satisfaction for AI products. While I acknowledge that there are a lot of true believers of AI out there, um, you should probably assume that the when it comes to the general population of your users, there's going to be a high degree of skepticism out there. Um, so spend some time thinking about like how like, uh, one, understand the source of that skepticism, right? And two, more importantly, ways to build trust over time to combat that uh, skepticism. And I'll give you an example. Um, something we do very intentionally and consistently at Sprig is what we call um, cite our sources. What I mean by that is that even though we are very confident about our AI's ability to distill accurate and useful information from thousands and thousands of survey responses or replay clips, um, we intentionally built into our product the ability to drill down and actually get to the first party raw data that backs up the insights and recommendations that our AI surfaces through product so that our users can build trust over time. So that's part one. Um, part two is like how do you 
leverage AI in your own practice, in your own craft of you know, understanding and optimizing for user satisfaction? And to that question, I say embrace qualitative data, right? We live in an age now where processing and examining and consuming large bodies of non-numeric quali qualitative data is no longer a luxury that no one can afford, can afford. And with AI, like product builders out there could really truly build that deep understanding and that empathy for their users based on firsthand experiences as opposed to you know, only observed user actions reduced to statistics. And, and that's something we deeply believe in at Sprig. In fact, you know, we believe in it so much that we put it on a billboard, which you might have seen, um, and that is to build, build product for people and not data points. You mentioned the uh, skepticism, some of the trust. I, I think sometimes we can also overplay that. Uh, another thing that John at Walmart mentioned this morning was like, let these things augment what the customer is already doing today. And they're basically boiling down into buckets of like, save them time, um, automate something away that they had to do boilerplate over and over again before, and uh, let them use human language to interact with a product. So um, in a lot of cases, we're overthinking, what if this thing isn't perfect? Which if you've worked with Gen AI, you know it's so far from, from being perfect. There's certain situations like Tesla's here I want them to be perfect when it comes to self-driving AI, you know? There's a lot of situations for us, a lot of us in the room, where it doesn't have to be perfect. It can just save the customer time, and, and the public's starting to gain an understanding of these things aren't perfect, I probably need to, you know, check my work sometimes here, but if we can save them time, augment those things away, and uh, just add value through LLM, it's worth us pursuing that and not overthinking it to, you know, cost us that product that could be getting into customers' hands. Yeah, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of add quickly to those comments on, um, I think just in, we find in building AI and, and kind of aligning it with um, kind of good user experiences is through experimentation. I think that, you know, that's in a lot of companies where there's a lot of great ideas. Everybody's really excited, as you mentioned, about AI. So, you know, a lot of these use cases tend to surface throughout the teams. Um, you know, from engineers, from product managers, designers, and, uh, but, you know, we kind of, see ourselves and our customers, sometimes those experiments, you know, can kind of get in trouble where you can, uh, you know, spend a lot of time and uh, kind of, you know, build this, this great concept, but you really have no way to execute it because it gets misaligned with your roadmap. So one thing we've been really focused on is making sure that we're keeping the AI experimentation and the priorities lockstep with our roadmap prioritization so that, you know, uh, we're kind of green lighting a certain level of experiments that we know that we can execute and then, you know, really spend the time to focus on them and do them really well and, and build them with great uh, UX overall. Amazing. Okay, well, we're almost at time and we're going to close with one final question across the three of you. Um, what is one final thought or piece of advice that you want to leave behind for everyone here? Product leaders, future product leaders, aspiring product leaders, all the people. What do you feel that you want to leave as words of wisdom. Adam, we'll start with you. So the, the title I'm looking at it right now, Accelerating Revenue Growth Through Product. I think when we think about revenue, like think about asking your customer, what could I build that would make you pay me more money? It feels kind of gross, right? Like we're, we're not, a lot of us come from backgrounds of engineering or design, like we're not wired for sales, which is revenue is a sales topic, um, but we love our teams, we love our companies, we love our products, and I think we've all been figuring out over the last couple of years, we do need to do a little bit more of this thinking about revenue, because if we love those things, we want them to survive, we need our customers to pay us, and so we gotta think about how do I build a product that adds value like you're talking about, and the customer will look at it as this is something that's worth paying for. So all that to say, it's not natural, but push yourself to think about it, think in terms of revenue, it will be worth it on the other side. So at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I would say, you know, value is at the end of the day what drives product success, what drives revenue growth. And so leverage your user satisfaction, understanding and, and KPIs to deeply understand and optimize for, for that value so that you can build products for people and not data points.
Yeah, I think, um, you know, just I, I'm a big believer in, in the concept of continuous improvement and just a focus on continuous improvement. And sometimes, you know, whether it's uh, some of these big projects, if you're, you're not user centric or you're having problems aligning with your, your customers, like, you know, don't get over intimidated, you know, start simple. Show quick wins, but but really keep that focus on um, you know learning, getting feedback from your teams, and and continuously improving. And I think that's you know really drives a lot of growth and success over time. Okay, that concludes our panel. So I want everybody to please give a round of applause to Adam, Cecilia, and Andrew. Thank you for being here today.